Good morning, Christ the King. Good morning, Christ the King. Good yes. morning. Okay, good. We're there. We're there. Good morning, Roger. Lucy, it's good to see you again. Lucy's like, why is he calling me out? Uh, <laughs> we're here to praise our Lord Jesus. It is so good to, to be here. It is good to, I hear myself everywhere. I must be turned up a little bit. It's not you, Steve, it's me. I turned up the whole band. It's, yeah. Well, we have a full band this morning and it's loud up here sometimes. Okay, let's get on with our songs. Hey, I got a one quick note. Uh, when we were singing earlier, Hosanna, the pre-chorus isn't there. So you won't have words for that. Just follow along or wing it or sing watermelon or whatever you need to do to get us that far. Anyway, you're missing a few words, but we'll get you through it. Let's start out with Change My Heart. Gretchen? This is a day that the Lord has made. Welcome to worship on this uh, beautiful Sunday. It's good to have all of you here with us today. Good to see all of you. And uh, we've got kind of a packed Sunday uh, because um, actually we have kind of a packed church life right now and that's really a good thing. It's a blessing. Um, there's a friendship pad. If you happen to be on this aisle, you will find that, and uh, we'd like you to take that out, beautify it with your name, pass it down uh, to the people uh, closest to you. That's one of the ways we register that you are here, and one of the ways that we also facilitate friendship and fellowship within our congregation. Um, just a note uh, that our missionaries, Fred and Wanda Garcia, will be here with us in early October. Once uh, we put things together, we'll get more details out to you, but uh, please be uh, preparing for Fred and Wanda. Also, uh, continue to pray for them. They're doing a vital ministry in Central America. Well, like I said, there's a lot happening in church right now. Uh, I want to encourage you to check out your bulletins and go through that. Uh, but just some of the highlights. Tomorrow night, tomorrow night, we've got Bibles and Brew. That is one of our Bible studies, and we meet at the Ward House Brewery at uh, 7 p.m., you're all welcome to come to that, both men and women. It's a good time of fellowship and a good time of exploring uh, in God's word and in uh, Christian faith and in our tradition. Um, our parents group will be meeting on Thursday night at 6 p.m. right here at the church. That's open to parents of any kids by, from the age of zero on up to 18. And uh, we'll be meeting here for a time of fellowship and a good study in the whole area of uh, Christian apologetics. 
Women of the Word is taking a day trip on September 29th. There's a little more detail about that in your bulletins uh, if you're interested, ladies. I will be out of the office on Thursday, September 28th for an AALC regional meeting in Wisconsin um, and also will be out of the office from October the 2nd until October the 9th for a vacation. So uh, if you need to get a hold of me, well, you can talk to one of our answering uh, things or else you can uh, leave a message with our front office. Uh, but those are the dates. Um, Mark Buecher, I think, is here to make a brief announcement about our uh, stewardship. Uh, Mark, are you here? There you are. You just suddenly appeared, so yeah. great. Please Good tell morning. Us. Good My morning. name is Mark Buecher. I'm here to encourage you with your stewardship walk here at Christ the King. First of all, I'd like to thank those who are on committees and the council. A big thank you for what you're doing. I'm asking the current members to reach out and invite others to join the respected committees. We are not here by accident. We are here by God's choosing. Psalm 139 says that our Heavenly Father formed each of us. You are one of a kind. You lack nothing so that God's grace can help you to do his will and further his kingdom. Our Good Shepherd has allowed us to be here at this time in history to fulfill his special purpose. All that has been accomplished here at Christ the King is a direct result of the Holy Spirit encouraging and equipping us to, do, to use your donations of time, talents, and treasures. Back in the narthex are sign-up sheets. Please prayerfully consider joining a committee that would fit your gift. In closing last week's Hebrew text, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving the kingdom that cannot be shaken and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. These are the announcements. Once again, the peace of the Lord be with you all. Please rise as you are able for our opening song in the start of worship proper. Oh, 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Scripture is very clear that if we say that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So at this time, please take a few moments in silence as we bring our prayers of confession before the throne of God's grace. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God has had mercy on us and for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ, and by his blood, he forgives us all our sins. On this year, true confession and in obedience to the Lord's command, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For those of you who, uh, uh, for whom the song was new, we learned this song last week and uh, we sang it at the beginning and the end of uh, worship and uh, uh, today we sing this as a response to the grace of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I find I find on my knees, with my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at my feet, I'll sing through the night, oh
from God's Word, both Old and New Testament. Our first reading this morning is from Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the ones who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over the sanctuary, and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. Here ends our first reading. Please join me in reading our Psalm 110 responsibly. I'll start out with the odd verses if you'll join me in the evens. Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty mighty scepter. scepter. Rule on in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will will execute judgment judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He He will will shatter shatter chiefs over over the wide earth. earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Our second reading is from Romans, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whomever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you'll receive his approval." for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of 
conscience. For because of this, you will also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. So pay what is owed, pay uh, taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to those who respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Here ends our reading. Please stand as you're able for the telling of the gospel. Please say this with me. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter, and St. Luke, the twelfth chapter. Glory be to you, O Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And again in Luke, instead seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated, and at this time I'll call the kids to come on forward for the children's sermon. All right, huh? Hey, hey, you guys coming for the children's? That's great. That's, that is great. You know, the, ch- uh, the children and the children's sermon are just growing up so fast, I don't know. It's great. It's okay, Riker. You can come on down. Okay. Yeah, this is about the first time I think he's done this, so, uh, Hi. He, he didn't do this before? Oh, okay, okay, first time. Well, welcome all. Hey, I want to ask you guys, um, and I think I know the answer to this, but um, uh, do all of you have favorite teams that you cheer for and you hope that they win? You all have a favorite team? Okay. Um, Tucker, I think I know yours, but what is your favorite team? Vikings. The Vikings, okay. I kind of knew that, kind of knew that. Um, Elsa, do you have a favorite team? You don't? Um, not the Marching Jays? It depends. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Margaret, do you have a favorite team? Never really gave it much thought. Okay. Okay. Cameron, do you have a favorite team? No. But there are teams that you kind of like, and when they do well, you feel really good. And if they're on TV or if you happen to be in the stadium, you're cheering for them, right? Okay, good. All right. And so um, when you go to a game or um, when, when you go to courtside and your team is winning and you're cheering, you're, you're probably, um, you know, wanting to encourage your team on. And, and let's say that they win, okay? Do you ever go home saying, I did that. It was my cheering and my yelling that made them win. No. I, I'm, I did that. You don't do that, no. Any of you do that? Any of you think that? Oh, you, you do, huh? Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, you know what? Um, that kind of blows my whole children's sermon and my message today, but that's okay. We'll, <laughs> we'll just go with that. The fact of the matter is most people do, they, no, no matter how loud they cheer, they know that they're not the ones actually winning the game. And um, it's kind of like that with God's kingdom. You're going to hear things in a couple minutes that um, say that uh, even though we seek for God's kingdom and we pray for it, um, God's kingdom comes uh, really apart from our uh, seeking and apart from our praying. God's kingdom uh, comes because God wants it to come and, and because God makes it happen, and it's a gift to us. And so uh, keep that in mind, that no matter how much we cheer, and it's a good thing to cheer, that's our job if we're fans, um, it's not us, it's, uh, it's the team on the field. And no matter what we do as far as seeking and praying for God's kingdom, God brings it and God... Uh, God makes that happen. All right. 
I think Riker's going on walkabout right about now and uh, enjoying the space of the sanctuary. It's a good thing. So uh, we're going to pray. Uh, so I'm uh, going to ask you to uh, close your eyes, put your hands together, and let's talk to God. Lord Jesus, help us to know that uh, you want us to seek your kingdom and you want us to pray for your kingdom, uh, but you also want us to know uh, that it is you who brings the kingdom. Help us to know that. Help every adult in this room to know that as well. And uh, we ask, Lord, that we would always see your kingdom and the blessings that you bring as uh, a pure gift on your part. We thank you for that, Lord Jesus. We pray all of this in your name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Okay. You guys did really good today. Thank you. Here you go. Okay. Make sure you get some M&Ms there. Good. Okay. And you guys too. You're here for the M&M's, right? For the bulletin. For the bulletin. I should know. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, once again, the Lord be with you. Um, we're in a sermon series entitled, uh, Thy Kingdom Come, and today is week two of that series. If you happen to miss last week's sermon, well, you can uh, uh, just go on YouTube, go on our channel, and you'll find week number one there, and that might help for you to uh, uh, kind of sort out some of the things that we're delving into in this week. Um, and this week, uh, in this series, Thy Kingdom Come, the topic is, how does God's kingdom come? How does God's kingdom come? So let me tell you a little bit about this last week's men's Bible study on Wednesday morning. Uh, Chris New is our teacher for that class. He's doing an excellent job with that. Uh, it's always an interesting discussion. And we are going through the Gospel of Luke right now. And this last uh, Wednesday, we were in Luke chapter 8, where Jesus and the disciples encounter a demon-possessed man. They go to the other side of the lake and they encounter this man, uh, you know, he's broken chains off his body, he's wearing no clothes, he's out in the wilderness, and he is demon-possessed. And it's not just one demon who has inhabited this man, it's a whole legion of demons, a whole bunch of them. And uh, uh, he uh, is the welcoming party who comes to the disciples as they're getting off the boat, and he sees Jesus, and he says, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God? We know who you are, and we beg you not to torment us. And so the demons implore Jesus not to send them into the abyss, the, the, the place of final destruction, but to send them somewhere else. And Jesus does that. And conveniently for them, there's this herd of pigs on the hill there. And Jesus sends the demons into the herd of pigs. And now the, uh, the pigs are demon-possessed. And they rush headlong off the cliff and into the lake, and they all drown. Now, that is a weird story by any stretch. That is a really strange story. And so the men had questions to ask about that. Um, one of their questions was, do we see this kind of uh, demonic confrontation in our world today? And the answer to that question is, yes, we do. It might not involve a herd of pigs, but uh, yes, there is demonic confrontation in our world today. The reason why we don't see it and why most of us don't discern that happening is that the devil is a master of disguise. He does uh, manifest himself in certain cultures in the way that I just described, uh, but in our culture, he's more likely to show up in a business suit. He's more likely to be college educated uh, if he's inhabiting someone. And uh, you might find the devil in boardrooms and in offices and um, even in churches. It happens. And so uh, we don't always see that. It's a matter of of perception and discernment and cultural filters through which we understand things. But what this story clearly, clearly shows, and I think this is a very important point, is that the kingdom of God 
is coming into this world. The kingdom of God is in the process of arriving here, and it isn't coming into a vacuum. Biblically speaking, who is in control of this planet? Who is the ruler of this world? And the answer to that is Satan. Biblically speaking, Satan is the ruler of this world. Uh, John chapter 12, it's about two or three days before Jesus goes to the cross, and he makes this statement. He says, now is the time for judgment. Now the ruler of this world, the prince of this world, will be cast out. And so even Jesus acknowledges and recognizes that the ruler of this world is Satan. And if that's true, there are some very important implications for us. Remember from last week that I said that God is sovereign everywhere and at all times. But there are areas of his creation that are in rebellion, that are not under his direct control and supervision. There is vast territory that is under the control of the devil, and that includes this earth, or most of it anyhow. And so when Jesus announces the kingdom of God is at hand, it's like he's saying, he's not saying God is sovereign. He's not saying that. He's saying the overthrow of Satan is just beginning, and the true king and the true kingdom have just arrived. And then he puts out the call, repent and join the battle. Repent and believe this good news. And so please understand that if we are truly thinking biblically, um, we are not the establishment. The church is not part of the establishment. Satan and his kingdom is the establishment. And we are here as rebel forces, and we are on enemy territory here as the church. Now, if you take that paradigm as the understanding of how the church is positioned in the world, a lot of other things begin to make sense to you. That we are the rebel forces, and therefore we are the aggressor. And so that gets at the question of how is it that God's kingdom comes? And what I'd like you to do, like we did last week, is open up your bulletins to page 8. And at the bottom of page 8, you will find... Uh, the questions from our catechism. And uh, there, uh, we did a couple of these last week, but we have a new third question there as well. And so I'm going to uh, read the bold print. You read the italics, and um, uh, let's do that. Uh, Thy kingdom come, what does this mean? The kingdom of God. And how does God's kingdom come? What does it mean that the kingdom of God comes without our prayer? And then once again, I'll read the verse from Luke 12. Seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And so, uh, to put it in a nutshell, there are two actions, there are two verbs that we are instructed to do by Jesus. We are to seek, to seek his kingdom, and we are to pray. But the answer to that third question specifically says that God's gracious rule and reign does not depend on our prayer or efforts. Yet de Jesus teaches us to seek and to pray for it. And if that confuses you at this point, welcome to the club. That is very confusing and it almost sounds contradictory. And I'm gonna try to unravel that for you. And here's what I think the point is. What the catechism is trying to tell us is that God's kingdom comes to us as a total gift by the grace of God. Uh, what the catechism is saying is that we in our own efforts cannot bring about the kingdom. We can't make it happen. We certainly can't earn it, and we certainly don't deserve it. The kingdom of God comes as an act of God's grace. But we can desire the kingdom. We can intensely desire the kingdom, and desiring it, we can seek it. 
We can seek for it. And we can pray with all our hearts for the kingdom to come. And so Jesus says this elsewhere. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And this, uh, that verse addresses this whole question about desire, what we truly desire. Do we really desire to see God's rule and reign completely overthrow Satan? Do we as God's people want God's kingdom to win? Do we want to win? And then we will desire it and we will ask for that. And uh, let me turn to uh, football for an illustration. This is a good time of the year to do that, right? So when there's a football game, one team wins, one team loses, right? And whose victory is it? When the team wins, whose victory is it? It's, it's the team's victory, right? Okay? It belongs to the players, the team, maybe the coach as well. They win the victory. No matter what the fans may be yelling from the stands or how loudly they are shouting instructions and loving encouragement to the players and shouting loving things at the other team and shouting loving things to the refs. The fact of the matter is that no fan goes home from a Vikings game thinking, yeah, we, we sealed the deal, our yelling. We beat the Chargers. It was us. I mean, you've got to be kidding. Nobody goes home from a Vikings game actually thinking that. Um, uh, well, there might be one. <laughs> okay. So uh, it's, it's the team on the field who wins the victory. It's their victory. And the Vikings, um, the Vikings will win eventually. All right? Okay. Well, that's a talk for another time. I guess not today. The job of the fans, on the other hand, the team plays and they win the victory. The job of the fans is to hunger and thirst for that victory, to seek the victory, and if they deem it uh, that they want to do this, they can pray for that victory. What is our role as citizens of the kingdom of God in bringing about the kingdom? Our role is to hunger and thirst for it, for the coming of God's kingdom, and to seek it, and to pray for it. And so, every week between now and October 29th, you're going to see in the bulletin the names of our ninth grade confirmands, and what we will be doing as a congregation is between now and then, we will be praying for each and every ninth grade confirmand by name. We will pray for them by name because what we're doing as we confirm them is we are enlisting them and we are sending them out into battle. So they'll need our prayers because we understand biblically that we are sending them as members of this church, as confirmed uh, citizens of the kingdom of God into hostile territory. They need our prayers. They will face temptations. They will face challenges. They will face every kind of um, uh, deterring activity on the part of the evil one to not follow through with their confirmation. Believe you me, they will face that. They need our prayers. And when we pray that kind of prayer, that the kingdom may come upon those confirmands, we are praying battlefield prayer. When we pray, thy kingdom come, we are praying battlefield prayer because there's a war on and there's a spiritual battle that we're fighting, and the kingdom of God is advancing into enemy territory. But if we are the rebel forces and the aggressors, that raises a, an interesting question. Doesn't that mean that we should be on the offensive? And just what kind of a battle should we, and now I'm using we in terms of we the kingdom, we the church, what kind of a battle should we be fighting anyway? You know, there's a lot of uh, talk about that. There's a lot of discussion amongst Christians about that and what the arena of our battle actually is. And politics is certainly an arena of battle in our world. And increasingly, it seems like the world of politics is uh, approaching and infringing upon the arena of the church. And this gets very tricky. There are times... Uh, and I think we are living in times that are such that the church finds itself increasingly face-to-face -face with political issues. 
And so this morning, a few minutes ago, we heard Romans chapter 13, which instructs us to respect and to obey the secular power of the states. Paul says that um, a governor or a magistrate is a servant of God. Literally, if you go into the Greek, a minister of God for your good, and he or she is there because, believe it or not, God has ordained that person. God has appointed that person to that position. And so Paul says we are to be good and obedient citizens of the state, even when the state happens to be the Roman Emperor Nero, as was the case when Paul was writing these words. But sometimes, sometimes we, the church, do have to take a stand. Uh, You probably heard that COVID is making a reappearance. We don't know what's going to happen yet. We don't know if there's going to be another lockdown or, uh, or not. Uh, But uh, let me just say this, that churches have got to obey God rather than men. And if the state is going to try to tell us once again how and when we can worship and with how many people we can worship, they are way out of their lane. And they're not operating under the authority that God has given them. And with all due respect in that scenario, we will be conscientious objectors. We will not comply with that order. When the state oversteps their authority and arrogates to themselves the moral and spiritual authority of the family or arrogates to themselves the moral and spiritual authority of the church, then we as families, we as a church, have to take a stand. When legislation is passed, as it has been done in California and Minnesota, which allows the state to override the rights of parents, who refuse to grant permission to their child who wishes to surgically mutilate their bodies, then the state is overstepping their God-given bounds, and the church has to take a stand. When political leaders assume that they, and not the parents, get to decide what is taught in our schools, what is placed in our libraries, they are overstepping their bounds. And the schools belong to who? The schools belong to us. The taxpayers and the schools belong to the parents, not to the teachers' unions, not to the National School Board Association. Those are our schools. And it's encouraging to see our parents across the country going to school board meetings and making their voices heard. These may be uh, the coming essential battles that Christians have to fight in the coming years. And by extension, if Christians are fighting those battles, that in some way or another um, involves the church. It interfaces with the church. And the church is coming face to face with these kinds of things. In many cases, we are being called upon to speak the truth because we have to take a stand. And yet we have to realize, and this is very important uh, for us understanding our scriptures today, we have to realize that the kingdom of God does not come in this way. The words of our catechism are trustworthy. The kingdom of God does not depend upon our effort or our prayers. And our struggle as a church is not against flesh and blood anyway, but against spiritual powers and principalities and authorities. And so what do we do? Since our prayers and efforts don't bring in God's kingdom, what do we do? How does God's kingdom come? Well, I'm going to now circle back to that uh, weird story that uh, the men and uh, we uh, went through at the men's Bible study on Wednesday, that story about the Gerasene demoniac, and I'm going to try to answer that question, what we do. God's kingdom comes, God's kingdom comes when Satan's kingdom goes. And Jesus said something interesting in light of this whole dimension of kingdoms and conflict. He said in Matthew 12, If I, by the Spirit of God, and in the Luke version, if I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Salvation, that is, the forgiveness of sins and healing, soundness of mind, and even clothing in this case, salvation all came upon the man when Jesus, by the Spirit of God, banished the demons and sent them packing into the herd of pigs. And the pigs rushed headlong down the cliff. You know the story. 
Where did those demons end up? And the answer to that is they ended up wherever Jesus wanted them. I mean, literally, they were at the bottom of the lake. But the demons had to go where Jesus sent them because Jesus has authority over the demonic. At that point, the man was delivered. He was restored. Uh, it could be said very clearly, the kingdom of God had come upon him. And so our men on Wednesday asked this question, well, where do we see this kind of decisive defeat of Satan now, today? And the answer to that question is answered by the kind of weaponry that God has equipped his kingdom and his church with. According to Ephesians chapter 6, the only offensive weapon that we are given, the only offensive weapon that we receive is a sword. And that sword is the Word of God. And when the Holy Scriptures are preached and taught accurately, then what happens is that the Word creates faith. It's a miracle. The Word creates faith. The Word implants itself into our hearts and into our mouths so that we say Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, Romans 10. And this is the faith that justifies and frees us from sin. When the scriptures are taught, God's people are instructed. They're equipped for every good work. They are strengthened. They are fortified. They're given joy. They're given future hope. They're given encouragement to live as Christians and to walk through this hostile world as Christians. God's word builds strong Christians who can stand in the evil day against every weapon form against them and stand against temptation and decipher the lies and deceptions that the world tells them. God's word gives them the wisdom and the insight to discern what's going on in this present darkness. And we also have not just the word of God preached and taught, we have the word of God in sacrament. And in the sacrament of holy baptism, we see the kingdom of God come, like I said earlier, as a sheer gift from God. And it's not dependent on our prayers or efforts. And so did you uh, realize, and you probably have, if you've been to a baptism, did you realize that uh, our baptism actually contains an exorcism? And so uh, uh, we go along at the baptismal service, and um, this is said to the baptizee or the parents or the sponsors. The question is directed to them, do you renounce all the forces of evil, the devil, and his empty promises? And then the baptizee parents or the sponsors say, I do, I do. And then the baptizee is taken, he's, he or she is baptized, sealed with the Holy Spirit, marked with the cross of Christ. And what has happened in all of that? What happens in holy baptism? The Bible teaches that we who were born under the dominion of Satan have just been transferred to a new kingdom, the kingdom of Christ. We who were by nature children of wrath and walking the pathway of Satan, according to Ephesians 2, we receive the forgiveness of sins. We receive the indwelling Holy Spirit. We get delivered to a new kingdom, and Satan, the strong man, is bound by the stronger man, Jesus Christ, who took on the form of a weak man, took on the form of sinful flesh, so that Satan himself was deceived, and Jesus entered Satan's house through crucifixion and his own death, and when he was in Satan's house, he plundered Satan's house of its goods. And the goods are you and me and everyone who is delivered through the waters of baptism. And Christ the crucified becomes Christ the victor. In baptism, God joins people to Jesus' death and resurrection. He gives them a new name. He clothes them in his righteousness, just like that uh, naked Gerasene demoniac was clothed with new clothes. He seats them with Christ at his right hand. And that means that this, this means that all of you, every one of you who has been baptized has undergone an exorcism. And every one of you who has been baptized is now by definition and by fact and reality more than conquerors with Christ over sin and death and the devil. In baptism, if by the Spirit of God, Jesus casts out sin and the devil, 
then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And that's how the kingdom of God comes to us. We're just the fans who enjoy it all. (laughs) But it is the Lord who brings that victory. As Paul says, and thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is, by the way, what evangelism is all about. You know what evangelism is? It's we fans who go out to the world and tell everybody we share the victory. I mean, you know, when your team wins, don't you want to tell somebody? Don't you want to talk about it and share the good news? Of course you do. That's what evangelism is, is we're simply the fans who are uh, basking in the glory of this victory and wanting to tell everyone we can find about it. You know, our neighbors, our coworkers, our family, the world. That's what evangelism is. And so, I'm going to close on this. If at the end of the day, beloved, you're tired and you're irritated with all the craziness that the world throws at us, all the craziness of the news, and when you become exhausted in your own struggle against sin and temptation, when you're discouraged that your own siblings, that your children, maybe your grandchildren, don't ever make it to church, when this little flock here is uh, defeated, feeling uh, uh, defeated by the lack of results that they see or the lack of volunteers, whatever the case may be, when you and I feel so beaten down by Satan and by sickness and by sadness that we're tempted to just throw in the towel and wonder, what's the point of it all? When we get to that point is when we keep praying, thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come. And we seek his kingdom and we thirst after it because the promise is this in our scripture, seek his kingdom and what you need will be added to you. And remember this, we're going to win. Amen? Amen. We're going to win. We the kingdom, that is. The Vikings, I can't vouch for, but we are going to win. We are going to win. So fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. And together... We will profess our faith. We will proclaim our victory using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let's join. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we continue to worship by giving our tithes and offerings to the Lord.
reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our sake you died. Church of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Blessed Lord, we pray thy kingdom come to us, to our families, our church, our community, our nation, and our world. Hear the prayers of your people and further the work of your church that you may find faith here on earth and amongst us upon your return. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our ninth grade confirmands this morning as they prepare for the rite of confirmation. And we ask, Lord, that you would prepare them and equip them for every good work which they will perform. We pray that you would protect them from the wiles and the strategies of the evil one in the world. And we ask, Lord, that you would walk with them, that you would arm them with the Holy Spirit, and that you would stir up that Holy Spirit within them, that they might be encouraged and moved to seek your kingdom with all their heart and to pray for it. And so this morning, Lord, we pray for Addie Banger, for Owen Honstad, for Trey Jensen, Darius Powell, and for Gavin Nowacki. And ask, Lord, that your mercies, your spirit, and your grace would be upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we pray for those who are needing healing, those who are anticipating medical attention, and those who are recovering. And so today we want to remember before you in our prayers, Chelsea Lund, Charlotte Lund, Merlin Preckel, Gerald Thor, Caleb Satterland, Barb Buecher, Kim Culp, Gerald Raymond, Gregory Easton Jr., Cindy Beck, Bill Bridget, Clifford Headland, Art and Mary Thole, Leona Wenzel, Gloria Doss, Merle Williamson, Alice Barasa, June Holman, Eileen Wobner, Nancy Green, Carrie Dale, Mike O'Neill, Ron Sieberson Sr., Mike Swanberg, Phyllis Swenson, Leland Root, Ruth Hawker, Dale Loken, and our missionaries Fred and Wanda Garcia. We also 
this morning want to lift up for special prayer the households of Dan and Betty Granzi and Jerry and Jane Gugisberg and all those we now name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction, the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Let's sing out on our closing song, Sing to the King.